So that was like one of the nicest introductions I have ever had. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that I was a little scared. Oh, she put my, my glasses up there. So I was a little scared when he was talking about how I asked him such poignant questions on the interview because, and there's my esteemed colleague who's always kept me on target because I tend to ask inappropriate and illegal questions <laughs> in job searches. Like, do you have children? Do you, do you want, the kinds of stuff you're not supposed to ask, but I legitimately just want to know so I can direct you to some place where there might be daycare centers for you. So I'm glad to hear him say that I asked him those questions after he had accepted the job. Um, <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. This, um, I first want to thank Dr. Okama and um, the Africana Studies program faculty and of course Joyce Harden for hosting this research talk and book signing. While I'm delighted to talk about this new edition of Charlotte Riley's autobiography and you will see I'm also going to talk about my new research project. The real pleasure comes in doing this among the members of my Villanova family. So. Thank you so much for um, just being here this afternoon. This means a great deal to me. Um, for our time together, uh, I'd like to do three things. The first thing I want to do is introduce you to the Reverend Charlotte Levy Riley, who was born into Charleston, South Carolina slavery and rose in the ranks of the African Methodist Episcopal Church as a teacher and a licensed preacher who assisted newly freed black people during the most violent years of post-reconstruction upheaval and served as a civil servant. Second, by doing so, I wish to place Riley among a group of black preaching and pious women who lived out and wrote about their ministerial and personal experiences in the 19th and early 20th century, thereby creating and contributing to a community that attempted to represent themselves and allowed others to do so, both visually and linguistically in purposeful ways to combat the rise of deleterious images of themselves in the public sphere. And third, I'd like for us to consider briefly a few iterations of these images placed in the hands of black and white producers of visual culture to advance their own intellectual, economic, and political agendas. So this last part is literally hot off the press, all right? <laughs> like I was finishing in my office and hit print and ran over here. Um, because I am still really thinking through some of this early foundational material and um, I wanna kinda try some of it out on you today. So I first became interested in the lives of 19th century black preaching women when I was in graduate school. And I think I was drawn to the few narratives that I read in scholar William Andrews's collection of three black women's autobiographies titled Sisters of the Spirit. Because as a child growing up in the Baptist church in West Philadelphia, I only saw three women preachers. Two were the wives of local preachers whose churches fellowshiped with us. And the women came, <clears throat> their wives came at various times as what we would call annual Women's Day speakers. And Women's Days in black churches are a big thing, Women's Days and Men's Days. And, and thinking back on it now, I understand why they were so important, in part because if the women were never allowed to be licensed formally, right, that these Women's Days allowed women to be showcased for what they did in the church, but also they could pick the speaker that they wanted. So these two women were, um, they were Women's Day speakers. And it was interesting because everyone was careful not to call them preachers, but to call them speakers. But everybody in their heart of heart knew that these women were preachers. And not only that they were really preachers, but they were probably better than most of the men who had the clerical titles, right? The other thing is that um, there was this only one woman who at my church was formally licensed to preach. And she only became so because she left the church where I worshiped and she went to become licensed at another church and only became so because when she returned, she came with her credentials in her hand. And she was only always referred to as evangelist and never reverend. Uh, 
And you know from formal ministerial um, ranks that reverend is the important term that signifies, unless you're in the Pentecostal church where elder signifies ordination, reverend signifies ordination. So she was always called evangelist. And she was basketball legend Kobe Bryant's paternal grandmother. And she was the mother of, that's Kobe's dad, Joe Bryant. Evangelist Georgia Bryant was one of my favorite people at church. She had fire and she had life and she always lifted the service when she spoke. I'll always remember her funeral as one of the most uplifting and inspirational events, and I call it an event, that I have ever attended. She was memorialized in the way that she had always ministered, but I watched her struggle throughout her years as a minister to find her place among the male clergy. Piety, I would argue, has been linked to black women, black American women, at least as early as the 18th century. For example, in this 1773 portrait of Bostonian Phyllis Wheatley. Pictured in the frontispiece of her London published collection of poetry called Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, Wheatley is posed, as you can see, seated at a writing table with her feather pen in hand, an inkwell, and a book that very well might be a prayer book or some kind of a biblical text. Her poetry, which considers a myriad of subjects, both spiritual and secular, definitively positions Wheatley as a woman of ardent Christian faith. So closely linked to her poetry was her spiritual devotion that Thomas Jefferson claimed to be, quote, unable to consider her artistic productions worthy of critical recognition in notes on the state of Virginia since, quote, religion indeed has produced a Phyllis Wheatley, but it could not produce a poet. In a course on African American women's literature in the early 1990s, I became acquainted with the lives of the earliest known black preaching women who were not only ardent in their religious devotion, but actively sought a place among the lettered and male clerical hierarchy of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and chose to write about their experiences. Jarena Lee, who's pictured there in the top left, the first woman licensed to preach in the AME Church, Zilpha Elaw and Julia Foote. Those top three were the ones that are collected in Sisters of the Spirit. They were all born in the mid-Atlantic region between Philadelphia and Delaware and New Jersey, and they were all born free. Later, I learned of other black preaching and spiritual women like Amanda Berry Smith and m missionary Virginia Brockton through the Schomburg Library of 19th Century African American Women Writers, edited by Henry Louis Gates Jr. And I mentioned the title because I think it's really important to acknowledge that the way that we get access to this kind of material is, be, is through the hard and painstaking work of folks that were trying to recover these texts. And so much of that kind of work was happening in the late 80s and the early 90s. Mentally strong, often physically challenged, determined and convinced of their divine calling and purpose, these women envisioned themselves as spiritual leaders and wrote themselves, except in the case of Sojourner Truth, who had someone write for her, into the formal literary record as communal role models, teachers of those who would follow them, and community activists. One such woman, Charlotte Riley, unlike her northern and freeborn sisters, was born a slave in Charleston, South Carolina, on August 26, 1839, to slave parents John and Sarah Levy. Sarah Levy, Charlotte's mother, passed away when Charlotte was very young, and her father died in 1861. Displaying, quote, a superior spirit as a child, which Riley says of herself, Riley loved books and letters beyond her age. As was the case for some black people enslaved in urban settings, the Levies were allowed to hire out their time at five to ten dollars a month and to rent a private room in town away from their master. 
They were also permitted to keep their daughter and four sons to themselves until their children were grown to what Riley calls, quote, years of usefulness. Riley notes that while strict South Carolina, South Carolina law forbade the teaching of slaves to read and write, she and her brothers were permitted to attend a trade school to learn a skill that would make them profitable to their owners. Charlotte was sent to a sewing school run by a local widow where, in addition to sewing, she learned reading and math. Early in the narrative, Riley relates the experience of her conversion to Christianity. In a fashion that's similar to narratives written by her northern counterparts, Riley focuses on her initial salvation experience as crucial to the narrative thread of her life and figures it as the first of many spiritual mysteries she would encounter. Her spiritual rebirth cap catapulted her into a life of service, teaching, preaching that would last through the end of the century and into the next. Riley was converted at a revival meeting on Sullivan's Island, South Carolina. Located southeast of Charleston and termed the, the Ellis Island of Black Americans, from 1700 to the end of the colonial period, Sullivan's Island served as a gateway to slavery in America for tens of thousands of captured Africans in the early 18th century. Between 1700 and 1800, at the height of the Atlantic slave trade, approximately 40% of Africans who were forcibly shipped to mainland North America came to the shores of South Carolina. Approximately 100,000 African, uh, African immigrants came through Charleston Harbor and were first quarantined on the island in buildings called pest houses. They were similar to structures that would later be used on New York's Ellis Island, to rid them of diseases that they might have contracted during the Middle Passage. So that block shows you how far south Sullivan's Island is. And here are kind of artistic renderings of, south, of, of Sullivan's Island and the way that um, newly arrived slaves would have been uh, investigated to see whether they had any diseases. The island no doubt held a special place in, in Riley's memory as a treasured location for relaxation. However, in the collective memory of American slaves, particularly South Carolinians, Sullivan's Island loomed as a place of quarantine and isolation. In the narrative, it serves as both a symbol of spiritual freedom and physical bondage. During the, the Civil War, Riley was taken by her grandmother's mistress to Anderson County, South Carolina, to remain there until the end of the conflict. And during her stay, she was approached by the town's architect, a free black man named Cornelius Riley. When he expressed his interest in her, Riley rebuffed his advances, explaining that she had no intention of leaving her mistress. And in the narrative, Cor Cornelius uh, promises to, quote, wait on time to settle the matter. In less than 15 days, Charlotte's mistress died. Now, he didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> we don't think. And this allowed the slave woman to accept Riley's marriage proposal. And in one of the most genealogically fruitful passages of the text, Riley lists the names of the white Sar South Carolina families who were present at her 1864 wedding, including Captain William Henry Perrineau, one of the most prominent South Carolinians of the time, in whose parlor Riley's nuptials took place. After marrying, Riley moved back to Charleston and began her work with the local church and Reconstruction Era School for black children. Like other black preaching women, however, Riley experienced isolation early on as her husband then moved her away from Charleston to Columbia, which moved her away from her church and her work in Charleston. The couple's inability to reconcile Charlotte's need to serve and teach and Cornelius's dislike of the African Methodist caused an irresolvable rift and the couple's ultimate separation. Now I wanna stop here and just say very briefly that for those that don't understand the origins of the AME Church, one of the things that we know about the AME Church is that many of these preachers were very fiery and they were very animated and charismatic. 
and it caused somewhat a rift within the AME church uh, for those that felt like, like many of the women, that they were uh, divinely inspired and they were all also uh, bolstered by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. For many of the men, they were also, they were interested in the fire, right? But they were also very interested in having an educated clergy and a, le a lettered clergy. And so for, uh, for Cornelius, who I think if I remember correctly, Cornelius really drops out of this, this document. Um, he is, uh, I, I think, Presbyterian. And so this move for her to go to the AME is just, it, it, you know, it's just outlandish for him. Even though she was part of the AME church when he married her. And this is the problem for many of these women. The men get them and promise them all kinds of stuff. Isn't that like men today? <laughs> Pro and promise them all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, you know, they don't follow through with, with any of the things they've prom promised. Dudes, you need to get it together. All right. Char Charlotte's work with the AME Church was extensive. For she contributed to the building of churches in South Carolina, the establishment of schools, and the spread of the Christian gospel to many in the area, blacks and white, men and women. She was licensed to preach in 1871, earning her the right to be called reverend. And again, remember what I talked about earlier. That's a big deal. And notably... She was appointed as pastor of Chester Mission AME Church in Columbia, South Carolina in 1884, although she never served in the position. So what happens is at the conference, she gets appointed, but then she, for whatever reason, she doesn't have to serve it out. But that appointment is a, is a big thing. Bishop has confidence in her and is willing to appoint her. Um, she... Um, is one of the founders of the Ebenezer AME Church in Lincolnville, South Carolina. That church, as you can see on the right-hand side, is still standing, and lots of uh, work upgrades have been done to it. I worked with a woman who um, wrote, she and her sister wrote uh, a biography, uh, um, uh, uh, a history, rather, of Lincolnville, South Carolina, and uh, Christine Hampton is her name, and she was very, very kind to me and met me on a couple of occasions when I went to do my work. She and her husband, uh, I went to go and try to find Riley's grave, and we, we walked through the swamps of the Sojourner Bible Cemetery, which is an American, historically African-American cemetery. It is, as you might imagine, all grown up with weeds, and we walked and walked, and we searched and searched, and were not able to find her grave, um, but Mrs. Hampton was able to get from one of the older members that original photograph for me, and um, and they made a copy and and gave it to me, which which I was very very grateful for. Um, significantly, um, for for I think for us contemporarily, she contributed to the rebuilding of at the AM the Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston the history of which reflects the development of religious institutions for African Americans in Charleston. Similar to the founding of Mother Bethel Church here in Philadelphia by R Reverend Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, Emmanuel AME's ch church's roots stem from the organizing of a religious group of free blacks and slaves in 1791 who were then members of Charleston's all-white Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1816, the same year Richard Allen established the first black religious denomination, black members withdrew from, oh my God, that's my phone. <laughs> this is what I get on my students about. I can't believe I did that. Please forgive. It's probably my mother wondering how my talk is going. Um, <laughs> So similar to the founding of Mother Bethel, um, Emmanuel's roots stem from this organizing of free blacks and slaves. So in that same year, there were black members of Emmanuel that withdrew over disputed ground. So here in Philadelphia, the dispute is over where blacks are allowed to sit in the church. But here it's about the, this burial ground. And so they withdraw under the leadership of Morris Brown, and they formed a separate congregation under the auspices of the AME Church. In 1822, the church was investigated for its involvement with a planned slave revolt by a man named Denmark Vesey. 
one of the church's founders. And he had organized a major slave uprising in Charleston. During the Vasey controversy, the church was burned. So worship services continued after the church was re rebuilt until 1834 when all black churches were outlawed. Then the, con the congregation subsequently met in secret um, until 1865 when it was formally reorganized and then named Emmanuel. The members rebuilt the church in 1872, a project that Riley refers to in her narrative as they would have been fundraising in 1867, 1868. That building was damaged in the earthquake of 1886. And the epicenter was infamously located near Charleston, South Carolina. Now the reason I bring this up is because that earthquake was one of the largest earthquakes in the history of the Southeast United States in the history of North America. It's by far the largest earthquake in the East. The major shock occurred on August 31st of 1886 at approximately 9.50 p.m. While it lasted only one minute, there was extensive damage to the city of Charleston and about 60 people died. Moreover, of the 435 or more earthquakes reported to have taken place in South Carolina between 1754 and 1975, more than 300 of them were considered to be aftershocks of that earthquake. And that's pretty amazing. That was a powerful quake. Riley rec recalls, quote, during the dreadful earthquake of 1886, that Charleston and its surroundings ought never to forget when men and women and children, even the beasts of the forest, were trying to run away from God's wondrous work, the surrounding scene of terror and alarm, and deprived of their Moses, calling herself Moses, to guide them, the writer as the lesser light, though supported by crutches on account of lameness, was sought for and pressed to come to the place they gathered at, and dispense to them God's sure words of promise as spoken by Jehovah. The current Gothic style uh, church located on Calhoun Street was rebuilt in 1891. Riley writes about attending the dedication of that building um, and her memories of the earlier structure, retaining its original altar, communion rail, pews, and light fixtures the church is one of only a few unaltered religious interiors in Charleston, especially from the Victorian period. Today, Emmanuel is the oldest AME church in the South and houses the oldest black congregation south of Baltimore, Maryland. The building is one of more than 1,400 historically significant buildings within the Charleston Old and Historic District. And the church, of, as we know most recently, made history on Wednesday, June 17, 2015, when a young white man entered the church, attended an hour-long Bible study, and then killed nine members of the church, including the pastor, South Carolina State Senator Reverend Clementa Pinckney, the youngest African-American elected as a South Carolina state legislator. Char Charlotte Riley's text offers contemporary readers a glimpse into a form of American slavery that allowed for some mobility among the enslaved, descriptions of life for newly freed African Americans, and of their harrowing experiences in the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction South. And while it is to be distinguished from the narratives written by her Northern counterparts, it can be characterized in narrative style and purpose alongside those works written by her Northern sisters. Black preaching women's narratives share at least five characteristics. One, they describe the narrator's conversion to Christianity. Two, they highlight the author's call to preach the gospel. Three, they wrestle with the problems of marriage and motherhood. Four, they outline the preacher's travel routes and their preaching campaigns, which often encompass details about their health and their stamina. And fifth, they use the autobiographical form to create types of written sermons in light of their being denied formal access to the AME hierarchy in most cases or experiencing resistance from their male counterparts. But I think another really important characteristic is the narrative's usefulness in addressing the moral development of a black readership 
and serving as a platform upon which women might demonstrate their adherence to middle class comportment and respectability. This became increasingly important as black women's lives and their bodies were jeopardized in the slave economy, ridiculed as they attempted to forge a future for themselves and their families in the wake of the Civil War, and outright disrespected even as free Northern subjects. While black preaching women wrote their lives and preaching careers into the canon of literary spiritual texts, the image of the black woman, specifically of the black pious woman, circulated in other cultural forms. For example, painter Matt William Matthew Pryor, who was born in 1806 and died in 1873, was known for his exquisite portraits and his ability to adapt his style to accommodate the economic variables that affected his clients. In other words, he advertised himself as a, quote, ornamental painter, and he offered portraits on, portrait painting on a sliding scale. That's his self-portrait. Two of his most well-known portraits were of middle-class clothing merchants, William and Nancy Lawson of Boston, Massachusetts. In her book, Portraits of a People, Picturing African Americans in the 19th Century, art historian Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw highlights the importance of examining portraits of free African Americans made prior to the Civil War in order to, quote, gain a better understanding of the power of representation and its role in the creation of selfhood, the exercise of agency, and the unique currency of identity that such images were able to mobilize against decided odds. Pryor probably became familiar with the Lawsons through their mutual interest in the Reverend William Miller. He was the founder of an early 1840s religious movement now known as Adventism that predicted the world's end sometime between March 1843 and March 1844. I do not know why March was significant. An avid follower of Miller and his doctrine known as Millerism, Pryor was commissioned to paint portraits of the preacher and a descriptive chart that he used in his lectures and books. According to one source, when the end of the world didn't occur, the group divided, but Pryor continued to believe in Miller's prophecies. So did the Lawsons. Nancy Lawson was born Nancy Foy, and she was the cousin to William Ellis Foy, who was a well-known Millerite preacher in Maine and in Boston. The Lawsons probably met William Pryor, the painter, at a Millerite lecture or conference. Nancy Lawson's avid belief in Millerism places her squarely within the realm of Christian piety. Elegantly poised, as you can see, Nancy Lawson sits before a dressed window framed by a deep red velvet curtain. Her lace white bonnet, black neck ribbon, purposefully positioned gold brooch, and a beautifully detailed forest green dress indicate her sense of style and fashion. As Shaw notes, her finger is placed between the pages of a book indicating her literacy. I would argue that her connection to Pryor and Millerism might reveal the book as a small Bible or prayer book or a doctrinal manual authored by Miller. William and Nancy Lawson's portraits were signed and dated just nine days apart and may have cost as much as $20 a piece. According to Shaw, such a price would have been more than a week's salary for a man of William Lawson's social standing. Their interest in sitting for their portraits, their attention to detail and to style, their willingness to pay such a price for their representation, and their trust in William Pryor to represent them favorably indicated their commitment to their self -reflection. Likewise, the portrait of Sarah Elizabeth Miller Tanner painted later in the century in 1897 by her son, internationally acclaimed artist Henry Ossawa Tanner, reveals a pious woman of dignity and grace. Shown in partial shadow as a prosperous yet conservative woman, 
Mrs. Tanner is dressed in a high necked, richly brocaded gown and shawl. You can't really see it, but take my word for it. <laughs> she is the wife of AME Bishop Benjamin Tucker Tanner. Elizabeth's role in the church and wider black community would have positioned her as a model of respectability, comportment, and morality. Her son highlighted his mother's regal carriage, choosing to emphasize her nearly 40-year marriage by the glow of her gold wedding band. As was the case for Sarah Tanner and the black women of the club women's movement and the holiness church women's movement, the power of the image of respectability served to combat the deleterious and dangerous stereotyping of African-American women as hypersexualized, lewd, and coarse. Take as an example the work of Williams, William Summers and Charles Hunt, engravers and delineators who lambasted the social customs, manners, and dress of free black northern men and women in a series of 17 engraved prints created between 1827 and 1837. The series of caricatures is titled Life in Philadelphia. It is a collection of social caricatures lampooning the pretensions and social ambitions of early 19th century middle class Philadelphians, particularly the growing community of educated free African Americans. Influenced by the increasing racism in the North, the African American characters are depicted with exaggerated features, wearing outlandish clothes, and speaking in patois and malapropisms to be portrayed as ineptly attempting to mimic white high society. Caricatures address courtship, society balls, fashion, Freemasonry, and the election of Andrew Jackson. I'm particularly interested in the image of the black woman depicted in these prints. So here this first one is called A Dead Cut, uh, 1829. The racist caricature portrays nouveau riche African Americans as prejudice against lower class African Americans, and you can't see all of what they're saying. It depicts these, this African American boot black who is there on the left, humbly greeting an elegantly dressed African American couple who feign ignorance of the man's acquaintance after their return from, quote, the spring. The raggedly dressed boot black holding his rod of boots in the one hand uh, uh, is, is speaks to this, this couple and grabs his hand and what he calls them that the man is Caesar, right? Like Caesar, like emperor. Caesar dressed in a hat and overcoat looks suspiciously at their joined hands and states that the boot black has mistaken his identity. His wife, dressed in a large bonnet and dark overcoat, agrees and has her hand indignantly placed on her hip as she declares, what does that impertinent nigga mean? In the second one, this one is called, Have You Any Flesh-Colored Stockings of 1831? There is a woman, an African-American woman, purchasing a pair of flesh-colored silk stockings in a hosiery store from a well-dressed white male sales clerk with a French accent. And you can tell that based on what he's saying to her. It depicts the woman standing at the counter in a bright uh, floral pattern dress and a huge hat that uh, is adorned with all these flowers and, and long ribbon. And she uses her monocle to inspect the gray colored stockings that the clerk is holding and which he has declared that they are of de first, de first quality. And another well-dressed person. Now, some scholars say that this person is African-American, but I question that. One, when you really look, the person looks like they might be white. And what's interesting to me is the way that they are depicted behind the curtain as if they're unwilling to come out in the same space as this black, as this black patron. Um, the next slide is this uh, Life in Philadelphia, A Black Ball, 1833, and it ridicules the coquettish manners and dress that are displayed at an African-American dance ball by depicting attendees making all of these mistakes as they flirt with one another. 
One male attendee promenades with Miss Zephyrina on his left, dressed in a yellow gown with these green pantalets, and another woman dressed in a pink gown on his right. He's impressed with Miss Zephyrina's rotations, right, misuse of the word recitations, from the poet Joe Miller, which she quotes, and he says, grace in all he tips, in him all action, dignity, and love. In front of them, Brutta Brutus gestures towards Miss Zephyrina and states that he feels the same thing. Brutus, who is cut, cutting him capers by himself, has impressed the lady in pink who looks wide-eyed upon his feet. And to the far right, you see the bow-legged gentleman with his outrageously big yellow tie accompanied by the short lady in green uh, who is shown to have this roving eye at Miss Zephyrina. And <coughs> it's the, he, he is talking as the, the, elegant, the elegant Venus in the trousers. And she makes his heart thump about and all of these folks are standing around as they are watching this social encounter. And then finally, this last one, a black tea party in 1883, is this racist character lamp la caricature lampooning the inept attempt by middle class African Americans to mimic the leisure culture of white high society depicting an African American tea party. To the far right, you have Miss Rosabella, who pours steaming hot tea into a cup, and you can see there that it tips over and spills onto the startled black cat on the floor, right? This reference to African American sense of uh, superstition. And the cat there is getting burned and trying to run away. And then you have to her right, Mr. Ludovico, who attends to the needs of Miss Araminta, who protests his taking the trouble. And then next to them is a disgruntled guest who demands another cup of tea. And an African-American servant and other guests, you've got this mother who's holding her baby, her small son there in the, in the, in the chair, all of whom are watching all of this kind of outlandish behavior at this time gone wrong. What's the point of The images, it seems to me, are quite harsh, in particular towards African-American women. It depicts them as loud, as masculine, as harsh, as undignified. They are dressed in outlandish and garish clothing, unable to keep pace with their white counterparts. The images also bring into question our understanding of African-American stereotypes that have traditionally fallen into rather neatly configured camps. Those of the antebellum period that characterized African-Americans as easy and incompetent, unable to survive without slavery's civilizing effect and the plantation's beneficent provision. And then on the other hand, those of the post-Civil War era that vilify African-American men in particular as violent, sexually aggressive brutes intent on consuming white female flesh and as zip coons, the ill-equipped to handle, the ill-equipped men mostly, but women also, ill-equipped to handle the privileges of citizenship. Instead, it seems to me, by so much of this work, that these kinds of assaults on African Americans, particularly of the North, and often of these spiritual women, are quite fluid, moving easily along a spectrum. It's no wonder that the defenders of black women sought to control the production of black fe the black female image in print and in other cultural spaces to portray themselves and to have themselves portrayed as morally upright, dignified, often devoid of emotion. While I recognize that the stakes are high, as many have argued before me, that the consequences are dire for black women who sought to express themselves outside of very strictly defined parameters, I think it's important for us to continue to explore the ways that 19th and 20th century African American women, and pious women in particular, have attempted to represent themselves. In my larger project, I want to argue 
that for African Americans and for whites, the pious black woman's body served as a threshing floor upon which artists and entrepreneurs could wrestle with complex American racial and class tensions. I employ the term threshing floor to invoke its biblical significance as a site of both judgment and blessing, a place where, like James Baldwin's protagonist in the novel Go Tell It on the Mountain, one might argue work through the, debase of, the debasement of sin and the exhilaration of salvation. Black writers used her image to struggle with their own alienation from the black church and their perception of the institution as socially repressive and emotionally outlandish. I would say that for those writers, the image of the pious black woman could be at once vilified and nostalgized. It's an image that invokes comfort, that of the older matriarch, but that was reminiscent for those modern intellectuals of a stifling provincialism and closed-mindedness that would not allow for modern thought and flexible moral boundaries. White writers placed upon her the burden of redeeming lost white souls tormented by a national racist identity. Producers of film and visual images considered her fluid identity and close identification with domesticity and sexuality a source for entertainment value and for revenues. Scholars have carefully examined the ways that African-American women speakers and writers of the 19th and 20th century have expressed their spiritual, political, and social impulses. Considerable attention has been paid to the stereotyping of African-Americans in literature and film. As well, there are histories of the black church and its various denominational structures. I do not think that there are any projects that have attempted to reinterpret key historical moments in the 19th and 20th century by reading wide-ranging and interracial literary and cultural texts through the lens of black female piety. I have tried, I hope successfully, by pointing to these few visual images to ask us to reconsider the, the black pious woman in the hands of the manufacturers of cultural knowledge and just to argue for how important that might be. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, we'll field a couple of questions. Uh, and uh, I also want to remind you that we'll have some refreshments. We're still covered. So hang on with us so that you can then partake of uh, the refreshments in a little while. Questions? It was that bad. You just don't have anything to say. <laughs> Hello. Chris, so I, I, know, I know you, um, you spoke about this uh, previously. Um, some examples um, from especially maybe 20th century literature of your um, close and point about the threshing floor and, and what the authors did with, with you know, the black pious woman. Yeah. So, so, th so this, w one of the things that I was trying to do today is to give you some very specific ways to, um, to sort of look at why black women would have wanted to control their image so carefully in particular, um, and I, I, for me at least, this is pretty important, the way that we have, for those of us that teach this stuff, I think, we, we have been so, I think we've been lulled to really believing that there are these kinds of delineations about the ways that black people, and in particular black women, have been depicted. And I think that it's, I think that it's, a, it's a much more fluid thing that's going on, and in my bigger project, I look at lots of stuff. So today I just wanted to look at some, some art, right? I wanted to look at some visual images. But I also look at the ways that this kind of thing shows up in literature, the way it shows up in film. Um, so a, another aspect of this project is, let's say, looking at characters that show up in white directed films like Imitation of Life, right? You have these, um, you have in the case of, depending on which version you're looking at, Delilah or Annie, who's the black woman who works with um, Claudette Colbert or Lana Turner's character, depending on who you're talking about. And of course, I'm talking about Fanny Hurst's novel um, and the, the film adaptation of it. And the way that 
that that black pious woman's image only gets used when it's of necessity, right? So things in the film is that, and I had a, a, I have a longer, way longer version of this that I was like chop, 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 everything, where we look at a character like um, the use of Mahalia Jackson in that 1950, 54 version of the film, who at the time is the biggest gospel singer in the nation. She actually is like the first to, to get that kind of international stardom as a gospel singer. And she's used in the film um, with the big stained glass window behind her and, and she sings for the funeral. What's so interesting to me is it's not until she's on her deathbed that we even find out that either Delilah or Annie, depending on which version of the film you're talking about, even goes to church, right? That she is, she is seen as a servant. She's a servant 24 hours a day. She, we don't know anything about her life, but in fact, we find out that she's got a lot of friends, enough friends that she can fill up a church, a big church at her funeral, and she is, um, she's a part of that kind of club movement that I was talking about. She's, she's, she says on her deathbed, all of my dues are paid up at my lodges, right? This is about the club movement. And so it's, it, it seems to me that in, in that case, at the same time that you have this kind of dignified image of Mahalia Jackson and what you want to do with her um, and the way that she represents um, a certain kind of middle class respectability, that at the same time we understand that really though black women really don't have a life outside of the way that they are useful for white people. So again, the, the argument that I'm trying to make here is that it depends on whose hand this image is in and what the way that it works. Um, the, the, the project just kind of has unfolded for me because every time I think I've found all the examples, like I find more. And I find them in the hands of, of white men, white women, black men, black women. And so here's what I'm sort of teasing out and struggling with is, What's the benefit for each group, right? How does she work for each group of people? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How did you find this narrative? The, okay, so I, I didn't talk about that in this. So I did it earlier um, in the year. I did a talk for gender and women's studies, and I talked about this. I was procrastinating. That's how I found it. Let me just be honest. I went to, to Wilberforce University and I was doing some work and I was supposed, she knows this and that's why she's bringing up this question. I was supposed to be doing some work on some, some AME church records and I just was bored. And I just stopped working and I was in these sort of cloistered archives with no windows and I was in there all by myself and I was just going stir crazy. So I just started looking around on the shelves and looking on the walls. And I'm telling you, there is no way to explain this except divine intervention. And you don't have to believe it, but as a preacher, I believe in 150%. I was standing at, on the shelves, looking on some of the shelves, and I saw this book, and I pulled it out, and I started looking at it, and it was between two cardboard it was bound with two cardboard pieces, right, covers. And I opened it up and I started reading it and I saw that it was privately published and I started screaming and ran downstairs to tell the librarians. I swear, it's in the book, like I write about it in the book, but I swear that's how it happened. And I ran downstairs to the librarians and I said, Miss Dorothy, I think I've something and she said you know as only a librarian can do you know like well let me see you know like <laughs> you might think you found something but you know you haven't found anything that we don't know about and the book had been a part of a collection by Bishop that had come from the estate of Bishop Levi Coppin who was an AME Bishop and his it, the estate had been bequeathed to Wilberforce 
um, University, which is an AME university. It's, it's sponsored by the AME Church. It's founded by the AME Church. And she looked at it and she said, well, yes, yeah, sweetie, I think you did. And I said to her, you got to hide this. I said, nobody else can find this until I'm ready to do whatever I want to do with it. And so she took a manila envelope like this and she said, all right, and it probably had something written on it like this, and she flipped it over, and she wrote my name, Crystal Lucky. And she said, all right. And then she, a, a, what do you call it, a, a, a file cabinet. She threw it in there and kicked it closed. She said, you better remember where I put it. She said, because I'm not going to remember. <laughs> you guys think I'm making this up. I swear I am not making this up. And so before she did that, before it, once she did it and I saw where it was, and then I took it back out and I said, can I make a copy of this because I don't want to leave this. And so I, I took, she let me take, make a copy, and then I contacted the same man who had, um, who had edited Sisters of the Spirit because I, I knew what a, what a brilliant scholar he was, and I trusted him. And I, I called him and I said, listen, I think I found something. You know, I hope you remember me. I had met him years before. I was like, I hope you remember me. He said, of course I remember you. Can you do me a favor? Can you send me this document in the mail? And I was like, okay. So I made, a, you know, made another copy, sent it to him, and he called me back in like two days. He was like, you've really found something. You found another slave narrative, right? We found another one that there were only like maybe, there's only maybe two extant copies of it. So um, I'm super happy about it. I'm also super happy that it allows me to go in some other directions, right? To keep thinking about these women who, who devoted their lives to trying to preach in the face of all kinds of opposition and who protected the image of black women. I think there was one other question. Oh yeah, absolutely, yes, there absolutely were. And you see some in the Methodist church. And, and in some ways, I mean, one of the things that has been really interesting to me as I've been working on this stuff for many years is the ways that I'm often, I'm often tempted to sort of go all the way back to the mystics, right, the women mystics, and, and follow that trajectory in that way. And I have to stop myself, because it's, you know, that's like a, a crazy undertaking. But I think in, in, in many ways, they're, they're kind of doing parallel kinds of work. And a lot in my dissertation, I was looking at the ways that what happens in, in white spiritual narratives is so similar in terms of structure and form in what happens for the black narrative, absolutely. And, and I will say this, the experiences are very similar for the women. I mean, they're, they're all talking about the way that they get converted. They're all talking about these deeply spiritual experiences that happen through visions, that happen through dreams. Um, folks that, that look like angels that end up in their bedrooms. I mean, it's, you know, and there's so much work has been done on this about the sort of the symbolism of the body in pain and the, and the way that, you know, all of this stuff so often breaks down into threes, right? They, they you know, they swoon for three days afterwards. And, I mean, all is, you know, it's all lined up with the crucifixion and the resurrection and, you know, it's, it's, it's really stylized, but it's stylized in very similar ways across racial lines. It's really, I mean, it's really interesting to me. To me it is, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so, so Riley, one of the things that she does, she, 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 she moves between first and third person a lot, so, which, which, I, which I think, and, and ways that I have argued in other places that, you know, this, and I'm not the only one that's argued this, but that it, that it, that it provides for her a kind of covering and protection, right? So that, you know, one, that she, you know, she works, you know, with this trope of the mysterious, you know, you, you can't question her and what happens to her because it's divine 
Um, and then it's almost like it's almost like the way that the Apostle Paul talks about being caught up in the third heaven, right? And the way that he says in Corinthians, I don't know if it's, it, you know, wh what he experienced, who he is, but he, you know, he gets caught up in the third heaven and, you know, is sort of out of it for three days. It's a very similar kind of a move and the appropriation of that kind of biblical language. One of the ways, one of the reasons why I think, I really, I know you guys think I'm crazy, but one of the reasons why I really feel like the Lord put this in my hands. I know I sound like Charlotte Riley and Jarena Lee, but I really feel like it's because I am kind of uniquely positioned to recognize the biblical language. So when I read this stuff, I know when she's shifting out of her own language into biblical language, which is why I was able to annotate this narrative so carefully. I knew when she would shift into hymn lyrics. I knew them because of my life as a Baptist girl. I knew, and some of the AME hymns are different, but I, I would read it and I would say, I, I, I would look at it and say, that's Romans 8, that's 1 Corinthians 13, that's Jeremiah. Like I, I knew the stuff because of my background. So that language she very seamlessly, almost like, um, almost like, um, oh, I can't think of the term right now. Um, what's the, when you shift between first and third? So indirect. Yes, free and direct discourse, right? In, 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 in very similar ways, she works very similarly with that kind of biblical language with first and third person. I mean, it's, it's really quite, it's really quite remarkable. Um, but, but again, after working on it, I realized I'm the person to do this, right? Because I, I can identify it. Um, and I never felt like a project in that way, like it was so uniquely suited to me and my set of skills and knowledge that I, I finally felt, you know, sort of, I don't know. I felt like, you know, all those years ago in the church has really paid off. <laughs> Are there any other questions? We'll yes. One more. Okay. You said at one point that she describes herself as, as Moses and that she yes. was appointed by the Bishop of the AME Church, but she never ended up serving. Yes. Him. What was her relationship to the sort of National AME Council? Are there records of her on, on that level? Yes. Was she a big deal in her time? Yes. So, yes. So, you, you find records of her, and she also had a sort of missionary partner. They are listed as lifetime missionaries so which is which is a really big deal which means that so the way that it works often appointments are for specified periods of time you know three years five years they're considered her and this woman named Emily Rodney they are listed as lifetime missionaries so it's kind of like they, they never have to come back before the council the other thing is that th this is one of the most important things about this text is that she lists the names of over 150 black and white people. I mean, that's remarkable for a 19th century text that, um, that allows us to see her direct relationships with really big folks in the AME church, bishops and pastors, who not only she works with, folks that they call her to come preach at their churches. I mean, you know, it's a, to a certain extent, you can say, well, she, she sort of toots her own horn, but she also provides newspaper clippings and accounts of things where, you know, it's really clear that people are recognizing her. I'll tell you this one last thing. When Teddy Roosevelt is, um, uh, when he's on his, I think, second um, inaugural train tour, she writes a letter to Washington and asks if he can come through that air, Lincolnville, which the, the sort of white town, so the, Lincolnville's the black incorporated town, the white town is called Somerville, and she asks if he can make that a part of his, you know, his famous train stops, and he does. And it's written about in the newspaper. I mean, this woman has clout. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's more than just her, her tooting her own horn. She's, she's very well respected. Thank, Thank you. you.